Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Business Today on our special edition of Market Gurus. With us is uh, a very fine gentleman, Mr. Sunil Subramaniam. He's the managing director at Sundaram Asset Management Company and has been a long-term watcher of the market over the past three decades. We've hosted uh, Sunil sir uh, earlier as well and his uh, views on the current market rally as well as uh, pockets of overvaluation and undervaluation in this uh, particular segment uh, go a long way in uh, adding value to our portfolios and of course enhancing our understanding of the market. Uh, so Neelji, without further ado, uh, let's begin with the uh, part as far as Nifty is concerned. So far we've seen uh, the index uh, hit a very strong record high in September, something like 20,220 and then uh, retrace a bit. While these are ups and downs of markets that uh, uh, people like you deal on a daily basis. But overall in 2023, the index is up 8.5% so far. Where do you see uh, these markets given that festivities are around and a lot of uh, uh, corporate developments, good earnings, good profits get reported in the second half of the financial year. How does the market look to you, sir? Uh, to me, uh, to be honest, the markets do look a bit volatile. You mentioned a lot of good news around the economy. And I think two things are there about the news. In the long run, the markets respect the economy, the nominal GDP growth. But the markets are also a function of flows. And I think that when flows are good, it tends to discount a lot of the good news that comes in. So right from middle of March to, to the early part of September, we've been consistently receiving FIF flows. And so the markets, as you mentioned, have given high single digit returns. But this month, if you notice, there has been a net, net withdrawal by FIIs. Right. And one needs to understand that this is not because of a changing economic ground reality. The ground reality remains of a positive festive season of the fact that uh, uh, Indian uh, all uh, frequency, high frequency indicators, uh, including GST collection and everything are showing very good numbers. So there's no disappointment on the economic front, but the flows into the market are a function of uh, relativity. Why do I say this? See, India is a stock in the eyes of an FII. And each stock, you know, in the benchmark emerging markets index, India carries a 15% weightage. So any movement of the uh, flows tends to affect the uh, relative overvaluation versus overweight versus underweight for an FII. And at this point in time, right, uh, the scenario for a FII is you look at this, all the emerging markets have been seeing a withdrawal of money. The reason for that is the hawkish comments by the Fed around the fact that their inflation fighting uh, has not slowed down the growth in the American economy. So they have indicated that they're likely to keep rates high for longer and maybe not look at a rate cut for quite a long time to come. So I think to that extent, uh, the, some of the short-term FII flows tend to live on borrowed money and hence their cost of borrowing are likely to remain high. So their margin of safety has come down to emerging markets because along with the sustained high interest rate, it means that the dollar will also probably remain at a sustained high level. So from a currency perspective, they are then not look, they are looking at a loss in emerging market economies from a currency perspective vis-a-vis -vis their investments. So to that extent, there's likely to be a slowdown of flows into emerging market because of the reality of the interest rate come currency situation there. The second aspect is within that, by and large, India has been getting positive flows except this month. But in the run-up to the next two months, the key thing to bear in mind is that India is a contrarian emerging market to the other emerging markets in the sense that we are the largest economy heavily dependent on oil there. 85, 80 percent plus of our crude requirements are metro imports. So as we head into winter, as we head into Russia and Saudi Arabia talking about production cuts, as we head into a period where the U.S. has used up all the firepower in terms of the strategic oil reserves, they are back to 1980s levels. The prices of oil are likely to remain high and maybe even breach $100 in the next couple of months till February, March. I see that this situation may continue. To that extent, for an FII oriented towards emerging market allocation to India, he is likely to be underweight India because oil prices are negative from an Indian fiscal trade deficit, current account deficit, EPS of commodity using com companies and the like. So I would say that 
there is a period of volatility. And finally, uh, Shelly ji, is that please remember that December month is the month when FIS tend to book profits, the hedge funds, in order to pay bonuses to their fund managers. So typically, as you're aware, history tells us that last weeks of December, there's always profit booking and some money flowing out. So over the next two, three months, good economic data is likely to be balanced by uh, tendency of FIS to book profits and take out. So the markets will be volatile in the very, very near term. Right. Uh, and this is where your expertise, Sunilji, comes in. Uh, we've seen a fantastic run up uh, across the board uh, uh, in the mid cap and the small cap space. Both indices have uh, substantially outperformed the Nifty uh, by a factor of two, two and a half, uh, three times. And it presents a problem for uh, asset allocators and money allocators such as you. How is the overall AMC structured in terms of uh, uh, the cash that it has it on its books? And where do you see money moving in over the next uh, uh, three to five months where you see uh, volatility because of oil prices probably dampening sentiment in India? So I see that, first of all, from our own cash positions, we have internal guidelines where we don't allow a fund manager to exceed 5% in cash. So we are uh, we don't allow cash calls because we believe the money has been given to the fund manager to manage in the market and not take a cash call. So 5% is the max limit. Our funds would be around about that. That's number one. Number two, given the volatility that's happened, there are two important factors to remember. One, a significant proportion of uh, FII flows into India, which used to be 100% in large cap, are today about 20% coming into mid cap segment. There are India dedicated mid cap funds outside India, which are getting flows. So some part of the mid cap rally has been due to FII's dedicated to mid cap putting in money there, right? Now, this component of that money is generally from a longer term play who's betting on the growth of India and the growth of mid caps in India. That's not likely to suffer from this volatility in the short run from the hedge funds because hedge funds largely tend to play in the large cap because they are taking a call on currency, interest rates, valuations and all of it. They don't get venture into the high risk mid cap territory when it comes to a country like India. So I would not expect too much volatility in the mid cap from the FII mid cap flow. That's number one. Number two, even though the volatility comes in the large cap space, I see that large caps will get a downside protection from mutual fund managers in their flexi cap and the multi cap and the larger mid cap funds allocating a little more to large cap because any selling by FIS will bring those valuation down to more reasonable levels. And end of the day, large cap companies are good, solid companies. Uh, they, fund managers were selling those in the recent past to FIIs. That's why you saw the returns of large cap indices are not beating the mid and small cap because the valuations had gone up perhaps beyond their comfort zone. But now as the selling from the FIS comes in due to oil and related factors, I expect fund managers to increase their allocation to large cap and provide some amount of downside support to large caps. So I see that volatility be far less in the large caps because of buying by domestic mutual funds. The okay. third aspect, if they have to buy these large caps, uh, if they're going to keep only a limited amount of cash, then they have to sell some mid and small caps to buy those large caps. Mm -hmm. So as you know, one rupee going into large cap to buy, removing one rupee from mid and small cap will lead a far greater volatility in the mid and small cap segment. So mid and small caps will have much higher volatility because of this. But to temper that volatility is the fact that the SIP book of mutual funds, which is touching close to 16,000 crores over the last six months has significantly been in the mid and small cap. So domestic fund managers are also receiving a lot of money, fresh SIP installments every month in mid cap and small cap funds, which will again provide a buying support. So while I expect a significant volatility, I think volatility will be far less than in a typical situation it would have been in the past. So be prepared for some volatility across large, mid and small, but there is downside protection through buying available right through the cap curve. Hence, investors need not worry too much if they can just hang in through this period of volatility and allocate more as the corrections happen that I think will be a very good long-term wealth creation opportunity for them. Right. Uh, so, Neil, sir, uh, you and I have a common friend who uh, runs uh, a small cap fund. Uh, I shall not name him uh, simply because, uh, uh, you know, uh, what was told was uh, uh, not in a public forum. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, the gentleman received a thousand crores uh, uh, overnight uh, from a single industrial house in a small cap fund. 
uh, to be invested uh, at that point of time. So I agree with you completely that uh, the the flow of funds into the small and the mid cap universe in India is so strong that uh, uh, any volatility will be uh, used as an opportunity to probably buy into. Now let's come uh, to the basics of valuations. Uh, you've been an old timer in the market and uh, have seen the disdain uh, with which PSUs uh, were treated with uh, uh, in the uh, you know decades of uh, 2000, uh, 2015. So this 15 year period was a washout for uh, uh, many public sector enterprises and they've made a very very sharp comeback. How are you sort of internally digesting the fact that uh, uh, the newest, smartest and the brightest kids on the block uh, at the moment in equities, RPSU, banks and that two second rung banks. Uh, uh, how are your fund managers uh, adjusting to this new reality, sir? Well, I think there is no, no uh, second question that one has to buy quality at all times, right? Now, many of these PSUs, uh, one is I will take PSU banks separately and non-bank PSUs in the other sectors separately, right? So PSUs have always been at a discount because there have been questions about the fact that uh, their professionalism, their uh, capital allocation, the fact that the government is a big owner means that their dividends will be high, so government will take away the money. They won't have time to reinvest in their business. These were the things which used to give a discount to PSUs overall vis-a-vis -vis the private sector players, right? Uh, in banking and in the other industries, right? Now, the two different views here, right? Now, the reason these uh, uh, low valuations, the price to book is a better bet when it comes to bank than price to earnings. And so the reason for that was uh, that, like I said, these many factors. Now, what is changing is the fact that in India, you are seeing that we are coming to the beginning of a capex cycle. And what this means is that a banking sector, which over the last half a dozen years was driven largely by a retail lending book explosion and with CapEx effectively having been shut down for the last half a dozen years, it meant that private sector players, not just banks, NBFCs too, were at the forefront of increasing their lending book. And COVID helped because it brought down the cost of capital for all the banks uh, in the country and the NBFC. Now, with the CapEx cycle recovering, the fact is that those deep pockets, the ability to do long-term funding backed by a strong CASA balance means that PSU banks are in an ideal position to grab a larger share of the corporate loan book growth because they have the experience, they have been in the business for 30, 40 years, right? So I think that one of the reasons for the drive up in those is because of this shift in the composition of the lending book and with their branch network and reach, uh, raising money for them is never an issue. So I think that what the market has now began to realize and value. And so as a funders, we've been also picking good quality because the quality comes because you don't want to lend into the next NPA cycle, right? You need to have good quality credit appraisal, good good quality thing to do the proper things. So believe as a long-term buy, good quality public sector banks have represented a good opportunity. We will continue to do that. So quality is the thing. Otherwise, I think the the degree of discount to private sector bank will come down, but it will never go away because that professionalism and the government ownership will always remain as a drag. So don't expect the PSU uh, bank index uh, valuations to get close to that. The sharpness will narrow, and you, but you'll have plenty of uh, wealth creation, profit making opportunities. As far as the PSUs in the non-banking sector, correct? I would say that you have to look at it in the context of the sector rather than as a PSU. Because there the up move is happening on the fact that the replacement value of these assets is looking ridiculous. They're looking at huge the embedded value in their businesses, the land, the real estate, they won't. And the fact that they hope that over a period of time, disinvestment and divestment will get professionalism. So it's a slightly longer term call. Their fate, in as far as our company is concerned, is to look at the underlying sector and not necessarily look at a low value, low P ratio, low price to book, public sector, corporate versus private sector. If we are bullish on that overall sector, then we will obviously look at a good quality public sector also there because corporate governance is not an issue as far as public sector is concerned. So I think basically the story is one of a catch up because the massive amount of liquidity coming in means that the private sector players in the respective industries the values have gone up. So the sharp difference is this is not worth it. There will be a catch up rally and the market is playing that rally. Limited extent, we will also play it that way in the non-banking space.
Right. Uh, Sunil ji, one uh, uh, point I often thought over was that uh, uh, in the last four or five years uh, where we've seen uh, the retail sector loan uh, uh, business getting overcrowded by all sorts of people is now uh, also seeing the entry of fintech players which have deep pockets uh, on both the technology side as well as uh, you know good uh, VC funding. So that's eaten into the uh, private sector monopoly of lending to uh, retailers as also the fact which you rightly mentioned that it's the corporate cycle that is coming up and traditionally industrial houses have uh, you know preferred to take money from PSU lenders rather than uh, private banks. Uh, let us see how that uh, uh, cycle pans out but yes the valuation differential between uh, private sector and uh, PSU banking sector uh, is uh, surely uh, narrowing over the last uh, six months or so. Uh, shifting focus to uh, one another segment at this point of time uh, is the fact that uh, autos are doing uh, Sunilji very very well in the markets. We have mm. seen uh, Maruti at a record high, uh, Tata Motors, Escorts, uh, uh, the two or three top two wheeler stocks uh, at uh, record plays. What do you think is uh, the underlying momentum behind uh, uh, this expansion of price that we are seeing uh, in the auto sector? So first of all is that they came of a very bad COVID period when uh, uh, you had also the semiconductor shortage, you had uh, commodity prices, uh, you know, later during the Ukraine war, commodity prices shot up. So auto was on the back end receiving of a uh, fact that people felt post COVID that the recovery would really happen, their input costs were very high and their valuations had got significantly damaged. So a lot of this is also a catch up rally from that period. That's number one. Number two is that catch up rally is also happening because now the catch up the pent up demand catch up is expected to play out and the that's being played in second is the world going into a slowdown would mean commodity prices ease and auto companies are heavy users of commodities and hence they expect positive margin play finally on the interest rate side also right uh india we don't see interest rates shooting up we see stable and so the EMIs for purchasing these vehicles are also likely to remain stable. In fact, even a rise in EMIs uh, in some segments hasn't prevented the demand catch up from happening. So people are more, more tolerant. So I think the consumption, the discretionary consumption story, I think is the one where uh, autos, housing and uh, consumer durables all have a part to play. And I think autos are benefiting from the upsizing of the premiumization of the Indian consumer. You can see clear disparity if you see a 7 lakh car plus the demand for that segment, the SUVs versus the entry level cars. So I think there's a premiumization happening which the auto industry is benefiting from and the whole Indian large family SUVs fitting in a large family, all that stories are I think playing out and I think auto has still some way to go. We remain overweight on auto in the next few years. Hello? Right. Uh, yes, uh, Sunil sir. Uh, now that uh, uh, let's focus on uh, one of your funds that's uh, uh, done a pretty fair job uh, over the last five years. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, Sundaram Services Fund. Uh, at the moment, the net asset value is about uh, 27 rupees uh, 45 paisa on the direct uh, and the growth option. Remember, uh, this is no investment advice. We are trying to discuss a particular sector uh, which is contributing about 54% to India's GDP. Uh, Sunil sir, uh, a fine performance coming in uh, uh, from this flexi cap offering that Sundaram had over the last five years. Uh, very smart returns uh, compared with the benchmark. Uh, and uh, most of the funds are invested in the private sector banking space. Uh, that's the overweight part. But uh, uh, for the moment now, that money is into private banks. Uh, is there a plan to somehow uh, shift focus towards public sector banks or you will let this uh, uh, behemoth keep on uh, moving in uh, this uh, uh, sea of uh, uh, fantastic quality and uh, compounding that we have seen over the last so many years, sir? 
so see basically if you see the services is a growth story and not a valuation story so it's not a fund which flexi cap in nature keeps shifting to find value within a pe rather it's a fund which is betting on the growth in india and private sector banks are a key part of that story and hence it has an overweight to that segment but the services fund is not just about banking if i may tell you that given that it's 54% of the gdp it's got about 14 sub sectors within it which got retail in it it's got logistics in it it's got qsr companies in it it's got aviation in it it's got uh, you know uh, consumer stuff non manufacturing stuff so the point behind the services fund very simple to explain is that 54% of india's gdp is from the services sector but when we launched the fund only 36% of the capital market was in the services sector so we believe there's a huge catch up because ultimately if you look at it the stock market has to reflect the reality of india and that's we are a services economy so over the last 5 years what has contributed to this fund giving uh, 20% plus cagr has been the fact that from 36% the market capitalization of services sector has moved to 40 so that 4% upward shift in the market capitalization of service related industries is what has delivered this return and we believe the journey will go from the 40 to 54 and we also believe that that 54 itself will be headed closer to 60 over a period of time so essentially it's a india growth fund if i may call it that way and the capital markets because of the whole jandan adar mobile the the whole financialization the whole uh, what do you call that uh, formalization of the economy means that the new entrants to the stock market are more likely be in the services sector than in any other sector so we care a lot of new additions will happen in the capital markets and these are the ones which will grow faster so we believe that the basic thesis is very sound for the services uh, thematic fund that ultimately india the manufacturing will grow but maybe at the cost of agriculture because for every one job in the manufacturing sector 1.8 jobs get right. created in the services sector to support it so it's a more fundamental thing financial services is overweight because the benchmarks have financial services and we do need to respect you mentioned that we beat in the benchmark so without respecting what's there in the benchmark so that's again a reflection of the position of banking and financial services in the indian economy right uh, at about 38% uh, financial services in the nifty are also uh, the biggest play when it comes to sectoral allocation what's really interesting is that uh, i was seeing uh, sip returns in this particular fund sunil sir and uh, uh, if you had just invested 10000 rupees over the last 5 years that amount would have been 6 lakh rupees but the actual return would have been 10 lakh 76000 so that's a annualized cagr of 23.6% uh, which in this kind of a market is phenomenal remember it was during this time that you also experienced covid you also experienced uh, the aftermath of the gst implementation as also the demonetization so if you hold quality stocks if you go through the sip route and you hold them for a period of more than 5 to 7 years uh, that is the kind of uh, market beating and index beating returns uh, that you see uh, sunil sir the other part uh, uh, within the services field is this uh, uh impact of technology that has come into lending since it's a lending focused uh, uh, portfolio and bharti airtel is also a technology company uh, reliance is also morphing into a, a technological platform would you believe that uh, uh, the underlying theme which is hidden from our view in this particular fund is actually technology see that's that's uh, the truth of the indian economy and hence the fund has to reflect it right i think the transformation india is today i think probably one of the fastest growing digital country in the world right in terms of everything so i think the indian economy itself will reflect the value of digitalization which is expressed through technology and hence this fund will also naturally reflect that if it is true to its style of following the indian economy's growth mm-hmm. uh fair point and if you you know drill down lower into uh, this particular funds portfolio you have uh, uh, phoenix mills which is an aspirational growth story you have uh, lnt mind tree uh, equita small finance bank uh, icici prudential life insurance company so you can see the tilt of the fund manager is more towards uh, uh, the services financial uh financial services space as also uh, something uh, that powers it immensely which is technology uh, sunil sir a final question to you 
uh, as far as the broader markets are concerned. Uh, one, where do you see the Nifty by say uh, March of 2024? You've mentioned a very, very strong overhang of uh, uh, firming up crude oil prices that might uh, delay the party in India. But uh, your estimate of uh, the Nifty over the next six months, sir? So I would say that uh, you mentioned March. And so if I may just take the liberty of going to April instead of to March, right? There is a reason why I'm asking you that, telling you that. Because I believe that uh, the winter lasts in uh, the Western countries till about the beginning of March, right? So this Fair year point. also, go back in time, mid-March is when FIF flows spoke up into India because as you herald a summer coming in, people expect oil prices to ease. So all the volatility of the next few months will ease dramatically from March onwards next year. And you will see that oil-related flows will actually spike up in India. Right? That's number one. Number two is from our own. So I expect that the RBI also at that point in time would be looking at possibly a rate cut in a scenario of a, of a situation where the Rabi crop has come and played its part. And I got strong confidence in this government's ability to combat inflation in an election year. As you know, uh, inflation loses you election. Growth may or may not win you election, but inflation loses you elections. So I believe the focus of the government will be on controlling inflation significantly in the run up to the election through fiscal policies. Hence, RBI will have a lot of room mm, to at least consider a rate cut. And I think so. That's why I said April. Right, sir. RBI April policy to facilitate and typically in the run up to the election you will see consumption get a boost as government also shifts its focus more towards consumption as opposed to infra in those few months and hence I expect a pre-election rally to happen. So mid-April in the run up to the election I think market will touch lifetime highs. It may go Wonderful. through a strong volatility before that, but these factors that I mentioned, expectation of oil dropping in summer, uh, RBI rate pause to cut, right, as well as the consumption boom in a pre-election month will mean that, of course, the opinion polls around the election results also will play an important part at that time. Fair point, Sunilji, and it's uh, such a pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, the north part of India has a wonderful saying, Aapke muh mein ghi shakkar. Let's hope uh, that the best happens as far as Indian markets are concerned. And I'm sure you will continue to join us to share your wonderful insights into what is probably uh, the best market rally that we've seen over the last uh, 50, 55 years as far as Indian markets are concerned. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And Thank you, Shetty. Also, I just want to end by complimenting business today on the accolades it has won in terms of viewership. Under your leadership, very well done. Congratulations. And like I said, I hope this may continue for many years to come. Right, sir. Uh, that's uh, a compliment meant for Siddharth Zarabi, the managing editor of BTTV. And I'm surely going to pass it on to him. Thank you so much for your uh, very you. kind words. Very kind of you, sir. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That's all that we have for uh, uh, market gurus in this episode. Do keep on watching Business Today Television. Welcome to the CEO at BT series. I'm Sakshi Batra. Here we bring you up close and personal conversations with the creme de la creme of India's sea suit to fetch you pertinent industry 